Association proudly present a very keen collaboration from the Department of Political Science, University of Philippines, Diliman. UP Diliman is the national university in the Philippines. It alone has around um, 8,000 students, while the Political Science Department has around 300 to 400 graduate and undergraduate students. The Political Science Department at University of Philippine Diliman is one and the only center of excellence in the political science uh, studies in the Philippines. This is according to the Higher Commission on Higher Education in the Philippines. It is home to eminent political science scholars who are also known for their expertise in international relations, democracy, and more. So I was welcomed by them back in 2005 as one of their fellow. And since then, we have been brothers and sisters. So it's actually best if we can mingle and talk over coffee or uh, tea breaks. But unfortunately, we are online. <laughs> so uh, please uh, make this opportunity uh, the best to get to know each other. The second collaborator today is the Indonesian uh, International Relations Association. Uh, is Bina Nusantara University or BINUS University. BINUS University is the top private uh, university in Indonesia, according to the QS World University Ranking 2021. And it is known for its international accreditations and tons of publications. So for brothers and sisters from BINUS University, thank you for uh, collaboration today. The third collaborator is of course energy policies. So uh, I would like now to uh, thank all of you, not only the speakers, but also the participants, which I would introduce later, who have been present and enthusiastic to support the association and the critical mind. We are very, very grateful. Now I would like to welcome the chair of International Relations Department of Binus University, Ranga Aditya, PhD to say a few words for us. The screen is yours, Ranga. Thank you very much, um, Badina. <clears throat> uh, good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Professor Herman Joseph Ascraft, MA. Welcome. Uh, also discussion for today, uh, Dr. Yulis Purwadi Hermawan, which also our board of experts in the IR Association in Indonesia as well as the faculty member in the uh, Department of International Relations, uh, University of Parahyangan. Welcome, Mas Pur. Also, one of our discussants, uh, Mr. Muhadi Sugiono, member of IHIE, also the faculty member of the International Relations Department in Gajah Mada University, Yogyakarta. Welcome, Pak Muhadi. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mas Ranga. Yeah. Uh, also, Mbak Dina, which already speaks for and open our forum for today. Uh, Mbak Dina, also our faculty member, as well as the founder of Synergy Policies, which Mbak Dina already mentioned before. And uh, Dr. Asep Kamaluddin Nasir, our chairperson for the association, as well as the vice rector for research and technology transfers, Binus University. Professor Tirta Mursitama. On behalf of the IR department, allow me to deliver our sincere welcome to all guests and participants of today's webinar, which also the 83rd International Lecture Series. Today's webinar is exceptional for three reasons. First, because it is the first international webinar held by Indonesian Association of International Relations, which also Madina already mentioned the launching of Critical Mind, this proves excellence progress for our beloved association in collaborating with foreign partner. And on this occasion, allow me to express my sincere gratitude to all collaborators who made this webinar can be happen to Indonesian Association of International Relations, the Political Science Department, University of Philippine Diliman, and also Synergy Policies. Uh, and not to forget all the committee in the Department of International Relations, Venus University. Thank you to you all. I hope this is not the only collaboration, but will extend to more uh, extensive and significant partnership. 
Second, because the issue is crucial for the world order. We all know how the Russian military operation in Ukraine has received intense attention worldwide. It is also notable to the webinar because today event is a series of events from the 10th uh, anniversary of International Relations Department. Binus University, 10 years ago, we established this international relation lecture series, which Mas Tirta uh, have the idea. And we aim to become a forum for IR scholars around the globe to share idea and thought about IR in regard to the peace and prosperity of the world. Uh, this thing is just, ladies and gentlemen, as we can remember on February 21st, 2022, uh, Russia officially recognized the independence of Donetsk and Luhansk two Spartacus region in East Ukraine. Uh, four days later, if I'm, yeah, four days later, Russian began military operation, striking major Ukrainian cities, including Kiev, Spark, uh, sparking international condemnation. At that moment, uh, I remember NATO condemn, uh, condemning Russia full-scale invasion of Ukraine, an independent, peaceful, and democratic country as well as a close partner uh, of NATO. The alliance call at that time for uh, President Putin to stop the war immediately and also withdraw all his forces from Ukraine without condition and engage in genuine diplomacy. While at the same time, the US also start a series of sanctions on Russia, which also impacted to the world. However, uh, up until now, how the war will conclude remain unclear. It is interesting to discuss what happened in Europe, especially NATO, to what extent did the US respond and policy contribute to the war, and how did this war uh, link to the world order? Those questions as are expected to be discussed in this webinar. Uh, well, without further ado, uh, lastly, I want to thank to all committee that have worked hard to make this webinar happen, and to all participants who have already attend this with webinar. Wish you all have a fruitful discussion and thank you to all speakers, discussion moderator, and also all the committee. Thank you very much. And I return the screen to Mbak Dina. Please, Mbak Dina. Thank you very much, Ranga, for such a warm, a warm welcome to all of us. Now I would like to introduce to you the host, yeah, the chair of Indonesian, uh, International Relations Association, Dr. Asep Kamaludin Nas Nasir, who is also the chair of International Relations Department of Universitas Pembangunan Nasional, Veteran, Jakarta. Uh, please, Kang Asep, initiate this initiative, Critical Mind. We're very much grateful for your support. The screen is yours, Kang Asep. Okay. Uh, is my voice clear or tenable, Ms. Dina? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, thank you for uh, all audience here, especially uh, to our uh, speakers. Uh, is Prof. Herman Joseph S. Kraft, Chair of the Department of Political Science, University of Philippines, Yemen, and all discussion. Uh, uh, there is here uh, Yudhis Purwadi Hermawan uh, and Mohadi Sugiono, and also Prof. Tirta. Yeah. Uh, on behalf of uh, inter with uh, you all here, and I hope we can continue our collaborate to like uh, discussion, seminar, or uh, research, maybe. So, uh, inshallah, uh, this moment is uh, the best for us to speak our future about uh, conflict. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, we can learn uh, about uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict here. Yeah. So, uh, the last 
I, I say thank you to uh, especially to uh, Dina Praktora Harja and Dinus University uh, who can uh, get gathering in, in our webinar here. Okay, I say thank you and see you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Asep, for the inauguration of Critical Mind. Okay, now let's talk about the beef of the issue, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. So our discussion today is expected to shed lights about Europe, about the United States, and about the world order. So many things have been said about this conflict. Uh, we already discussed how tragic it is, how uh, bad it is for humanity, and so on. But we need to look between the lines, go beyond what the media and what politicians say about the conflict. So as scholars of international relations, I would like to urge all of us to ponder about, for instance, European unity, about how the conflict affect EU members. So not just the NATO members, but the EU members how the United States relate with NATO in this instance and with the rest of Europe, what the US strategic position is or has become both globally and in our neck of the wood in ASEAN and Indo-Pacific. So at the end of the day, hopefully we can take home some of the uh, implications that uh, we should anticipate for Indonesia, for the Philippines, for Southeast Asian countries in general. Our speaker today is very special, Professor Herman Joseph Kraft. Herman is a professor and chair of the Department of Political Science at the University of the Philippines in Diliman, Quezon City. He is also convener of the Strategic Studies Programs for the Center of Integrative and Development Studies at the UP Diliman. He has been published numerous articles and book chapters on Southeast Asia, particularly on regional security, security sector reform, intrastate conflicts, everything about conflicts and peace, I suppose. <laughs> and his capacity has, uh, uh, has been giving him the chance to add advice, yeah, Foreign Service Institute in the Philippines, the Armed Forces of the Philippines, and of course, the different departments uh, across the Philippines and educational sectors. His education is relevant for us to also discuss here. He discussed great power dynamics and waning of Asian centrality in regional security. That was back in 2017, the publication. So I'm sure it's one of the things that he would bring up to the forum today. I would like to welcome uh, Professor Herman. The screen is yours, Professor. Thank you, um, Dina, for the very kind uh, uh, introduction. Um, it's a bit intimidating to be introduced as being special. Uh, um, and and, and um, I, I hope that uh, uh, my participation here is actually going to be uh, to contribute something to the, uh, uh, to the uh, discussion on this particular issue. Um, I'll have to, uh, uh, um, at the onset, uh, I, I'd like to actually um, make clear uh, the idea that um, um, I, I think the conflict uh, in Ukraine right now is still, you might say, early days in terms of us understanding where it's going, understanding uh, the extent of uh, its implications, its effects. No, um, uh, in particular, if we're going to go down to our discipline, for instance, no. What are its implications as far as how we theorize about international relations, for instance? You know, all of these things you know, um, become uh, an important factor or, or, or an important uh, consideration for, for, for our uh, uh, discussion. You know? um, and, and, and so if we actually take a look at uh, the uh, situation, and I think um, uh, Dr. Aditya actually talked about this earlier on now in terms of the timelines, what actually happened. So I won't, I won't go into uh, those, uh, uh, those aspects of the uh, uh, conflict. No? Um, we just know that all of a sudden, no? uh, in February of 2022, no? um, uh, Russia actually sent across its borders with, uh, 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 with, with, with Ukraine no? military forces with the intention of 
uh, uh, fundamentally um, enforcing no, uh, a particular policy uh, uh, that was expressed in terms of trying to denazify uh, uh, Ukraine no, uh, and uh, to protect um, um, ethnic Russians and Russian speakers, no, uh, particularly in the eastern part of uh, uh, Ukraine. Now, these are all very interesting, if you will, no, um, and and I, I I know that for many of us, the war actually caught our not only our attention but our interest. No, um, it's the first major war uh, that we've actually encountered, and for international relations scholars, no, um, it's something uh, that that whets the appetite. No, in terms of us trying to understand. Know, what the uh, implications are uh, of this conflict no? uh, for how we look, look at uh, 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 international relations. Um, the topic that we have no, uh, for today is not just about the Russia-Ukraine conflict. It's actually about what this conflict actually tells us about Europe, the United States, and world order. No? And to a large extent, that's going to be very important. No, it's a Tall order, actually, for, for uh, 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 what we're trying to achieve here. But I think it is important for us to understand how the conflict is um, uh, uh, not so much transforming, but making us more reflective about our inter uh, uh, about our um, understanding no? uh, of, of uh, Europe no? um, and its centrality as far as international relations is actually concerned. The United States as hegemon no, uh, in the international system, no. How does that? Uh, uh, how is the conflict actually influencing that particular role and status that it actually has? Does it still have that particular status? Can we still consider the world order that we have right now, no, as something that is an extension of that liberal world order that the United States had put into place post Second World War and then extending into the post Cold War era, right? And what kind of world order are we looking at now? These things are all part and parcel of the conversation that we're having. But, but um, just like I said, it's a conversation. There are no conclusions that we can actually come up with as these things are still happening at this point in time. So it is really a question of what questions are arising, no? what research issues can we actually look into no? as far as this, uh, this, uh, this um, uh, conflict is actually concerned. No? Um, this, this map, no? Um, is a map of the Ukraine of Ukraine no, uh, in 2021, just prior to the war, no, um, or to the invasion no, uh, in, in in February 2022. And what this shows, no, um, is that the Ukraine was uh, that the Ukraine um, had areas in its east, no, uh, the Luhansk uh, uh, and Donetsk, uh, Donetsk area, which um, which is short a uh, short cut for it is actually Donbas region, no, which has been a part of a continuing conflict, no low key, low intensity, if you will, but conflict nonetheless that's been going on, no, um, for 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 some time now, no. So in other words, while the world is probably familiar with the invasion, no, uh, in February of 2022, there has been conflict going on in the eastern part of the Ukraine, no, uh, 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 for 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 a number of years already, and therefore a number of casualties no, uh, uh, and, and um, uh, destruction has already been taking place in that part of the region. No? Um, but what is important here okay, is to take a look at that continuing issue and how it has actually affected no, the way that the uh, the, the, the way that, that the countries around the area, so we're talking about uh, 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 the West, uh, um, the European countries, no, um, actually look at this particular issue. Russia has actually expressed, and this goes back to questions about, you know, um, uh, the point that was uh, uh, made in the introduction regarding the notion of um, how much of this conflict, no, because at, at, its, at face value, Right, the war was started by an invasion from Russia of Ukraine, right? But part of the argument has been made uh, that Russia was pushed into a situation where this was a course of action that it had to take, right? Um, so this is interesting precisely because this goes back to our to our discipline itself, not to international relations. No, um, a large part of the 
justification, the 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 rhetoric that came out of you know, following the um, uh, following the invasion in February, you know, um, goes back to you no know, um, uh, conceptions of geopolitics, right? Um, the idea of Russia talking about the the the, the notion of um, its need for buffer states, you no, know, to protect itself from you no know, what has traditionally been uh, uh, the direction of invasions of Russia, right? Uh, and and um, Ukraine has always been seen as being a uh, 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 an easy way into no uh, 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 into the Russian heartland as far as um, uh, uh, invasions are concerned. The First World War, Second World War are all indicative of what 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 has happened along along these lines, right? So. The, I, the argument that has been made by Russia is the need for buffer states no, or buffer zones. No? Um, all goes back to no, um, uh, uh, old conceptions about geopolitics. No? Um, the notion that you need to have um, buffer zones to actually increase uh, uh, the sec security of uh, uh, states. No? Um, and more so if you're talking about no, great powers no, like, uh, 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 like Russia. The interesting point here no um, is that geopolitics no um to a large extent no uh is really all about the use of power in order to uh, uh to control no a uh, geographic space right and in that context no foreign policy becomes part of or at least geopolitics is part of how foreign policy makers no um, make um, uh, uh, calculations no uh, about what they actually intend to do okay um, so the interesting point that has to be taken into consideration here, no, is that the idea, no, um, uh, of Russia feeling uh, threatened, no, um, by the expansion of NATO eastwards, right? So all of these countries, no, that we see at the edge of the map, Poland, Slovenia, Hungary, no, um, and Romania are all part of NATO at this point in time, no. So this eastward uh, uh, reach no um, by NATO was seen as an ar uh, as an argument on the part of Russia no um, for an increase on its uh, for for uh, problems no on its own security okay um, and yet those countries joined NATO precisely no uh, in order to seek more security no uh, against what they felt was the main threat no what which was actually Russia no again going back to our discipline. Now, this pretty much hangs on to what we've been talking about, uh, uh, what our discipline refers to as the security dilemma. Countries taking you know, steps to increase their security only leads to insecurity for neighboring countries and therefore you know, um, uh, uh, going for a, 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 um, an exchange you know, uh, uh, as far as this issue is concerned. And I think that justification or that issue um, has been used by Russia as a justification for its invasion of uh, the Ukraine. No, so this map uh, in turn shows no, the direction no, of that invasion in February. No, um, initially, no, it sought to actually go for or at least capture Kiev. No, um, moving west uh, westwards no, from the uh, uh, from the eastern uh, regions of the Donbas, and then northwards no, from Crimea. No, capture uh, Kherson. We already know that the port of Mariupol has already fallen to the control of uh, 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 of Russia, no, and to a large extent, no. Um, uh, uh, this was the situation as far as March, no, of this year was actually concerned, right? The idea was that the, from the Donbas region, no, um, there is also a geoeconomic aspect to it, no, in terms of controlling, no, the Don, the Donetsk, no, and uh, uh, and Don. Uh, 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 regions no, um, that would act, that would allow Russia to actually access the uh, economic resources that are actually there. Okay, um, by early May, however, no, the uh, uh, the trust into Kiev has been defeated. No, and so the um, uh, 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 focus of Russian military operations no has been on more of the um, eastern uh, 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 eastern uh, zone. No, uh, and also the southern zone coming from Crimea. Okay, and again, like I said, Mariupol has already been captured by by the Russians, right? So, militarily, these are the things that we actually understand about what is going on in the conflict, right? No, 
um, politically and to actually show the extent to which we're actually, uh, uh, what, what it is that we're looking at you now when we talk about, of course, the extent of the impact of you know, uh, uh, this, this, this uh, conflict. You know? um, these are the borders that we're actually looking at. You know? um, the green space that you find here you know, is, of course, the Ukraine. The green here is Georgia. And then all the blue spaces here refer to, of course, the members of the, or uh, that part of Europe that, uh, that, is, that constitutes you know, the European Union. Okay? Um, it just goes to show you know, um, uh, uh, how extensive the border network is you know, between the European Union and, 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 and Russia. Now, what this map shows you know, is actually um, a part you know, of the relationship between Europe and Russia that's not very familiar to us, no? and that is to say competing networks no, of economic relations, right? Um, those in the red, the, 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 the part that uh, uh, Russia actually uh, uh, seeks to uh, uh, increase its relationship with, no, constitutes, of course, the Eurasian Commission member states, no? um, states that Russia has some sort of customs union arrangement with, and the blue, of, or of course, U European Union member uh, uh, states. The green parts indicate to us areas that can be and in fact are sought after no? um, uh, by both uh, uh, groups. No? And therefore you can see that there is some sort of competition in terms of membership no? uh, for different countries uh, 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 joining no? uh, uh, either the European Union or the Eurasian Commission uh, uh, member states. No? Um, okay. Let's go to the points that were being raised by uh, uh, Dina earlier on, you know, that we need to talk about things, issues you know, that have to do with Europe, particularly questions that have to do with European uni uh, uh, unity. One of the things that um, actually took place you know, um, prior to, and, and it, has, it has to a certain extent shaped uh, uh, our uh, uh, impressions about Europe for the past uh, several years, you know, um, is of course Brexit, right? And what Brexit has actually given us in terms of our impressions of Europe is that the European project, the idea of a European Union, you know, uh, uh, including all of these members, uh, all of these member states, you no, know, being part of either the EU, the Eurozone, you no, know, um, uh, uh, and discussions that are going on as far as a European uh, uh, security and political uh, uh, union, you no, know, um, is is of course part of what we were actually, uh, the impressions that we had as far as Europe was concerned, that to a large extent, the European project was in trouble, right? That countries, no, um, that, that, the, that, that Brexit showed that you know, there's an overreach of some sort and that other member states of Europe were also considering you know, the fact of the problem of being part of EU was not worth the trouble and might consider actually uh, 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 leaving. No? Um, so there were those kinds of discussions no, which shaped our ideas no, that, yeah, Europe seems to be in trouble at this point in time. It has to resolve those, those kinds of issues. No? Well, the Ukraine invasion actually takes place, no, and which basically gives us the impression now that um, all of a sudden, the Europeans are united no, in terms of their concern for the uh, uh, the um, uh, the political ambitions, if you will, no, and military aggressiveness, no, of of uh, of, of Russia, no, and therefore, no, has become the principal concern, and now become the uh, the area around which not the Europeans are actually uh, 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 coalescing, no, um, and in fact, um, internal issues, no, uh, in 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 Europe about the behavior of some of the members of the EU, no, are suddenly set aside. Right, um, Poland, for instance, no, um, was at some point in time, no, uh, being criticized, no, for its growing authoritarian uh, uh, tendencies, no, and the curbs to human rights, no, that uh, had been adopted as far as some of the policies, no, laws that that uh, uh, the uh, 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 Polish uh, um, um, parliament had actually adopted, no. So there were those kinds of concerns that, uh, which goes back to the point that I was making about you know, um, a sense of trouble about the European project. No? Now, Poland is the fulcrum of Europe's response not to the Russian invasion. It has become 
uh, the front line, no, uh, as far as the uh, 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 as far as Europe's response to um, uh, the Re Russian invasion is concerned, it has been the hero, no, uh, in terms of receiving, no, millions of uh, uh, refugees, no, coming from uh, 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 Eastern uh, Ukraine, no, um, and giving succor, no, to all of this. Uh, people who have been displaced no, by the war that's actually taking place in, in Ukraine. No? Um, to a large extent, no, um, uh, uh, um, uh, Poland has become a symbol for no, um, Europe's uh, uh, attempts to actually face up to no, um, uh, uh, face up to uh, Russia. No? Um, it's not Germany. No? In fact, Germany is being criticized no, for, for for the weakness, no, uh, the tepidness of its response, not so far, no. Um, despite the fact that, of course, uh, it had bet on, no, the relationship with Russia, no. Uh, I think Germany pretty much was uh, 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 on the lead uh, or um, provided uh, uh, the leadership, no, in terms of the idea that um, uh, increasing economic relations with Russia would actually lead to better. No, and more peaceful and stable relations uh, 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 with Russia. No? Now, all of that is, of course, thrown out the window no, with the invasion of, uh, of Poland. But, but what this shows no, um, is, is that um, there are still issues within Europe that have to be settled, despite the fact that I think there's now a sense that um, what used to be uh, areas of debate, no, there's some some degree of unanimity no, on, 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 uh, on the fact that Europe now has to stand up to uh, uh, Russia. And that includes Germany actually now uh, increasing, not deciding that it has to increase uh, uh, um, uh, uh, its, its military budget no, to the pledged 2% of GDP that all NATO countries are supposed to actually uh, uh, provide. No? Um, but Aside from that, no, is the increasing support that Germany is now giving, together with other countries uh, in in Europe, no, um, to Ukraine's uh, military resistance, no, against uh, uh, against Russia, okay. But the interesting part here, no, is that even as I will go to NATO later on, no, even as we do have NATO, no, the war has actually set into motion the possibility that EU might actually. Um, uh, 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 increase its intra-European defense cooperation, right? Um, uh, um, an, an area that before no, uh, uh, received rather uh, weak uh, support within uh, uh, within Europe, but now increasingly, no, especially with the issues no, uh, uh, in Ukraine, no, Macron's call for a European strategic autonomy is now gaining some traction. Right, and that uh, to a large extent there are considerations now within Europe about um, uh, 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 increasing intra-European defense cooperation. Okay, um, but that's not to say, and this goes back to the earlier point. No, um, the issues that we dis that that uh, uh, define uh, the questions we had about European unity prior to the invasion are still there. No, and this has to do largely with questions of right-wing radicalism, no, and populism, no, um, in in, uh, 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 in in Western European countries, no. Um, Poland and Hungary, Poland, which is as I said, no, has become the front line, no, state as far as uh, Europe's response to uh, um, uh, Russia, the Russian invasion is concerned, no. Um, is actually dominated politically, no, by uh, by the Law and Justice Party, which is a right-wing party, no, um, that emphasizes nationalism, emphasizes uh, uh, that's opposed to, um, uh, that's very much opposed to uh, 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 immigration, no, um, and has adopted, no, um, social uh, 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 policies, no, um, which seem to go. Against no some of the more liberal policies, no that um, that the European Union actually espouses. No, it, this is what I was talking about when when I mentioned the idea of problems, not growing authoritarianism, no uh, in, in 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 Poland, for instance. Hungary is another uh, uh, case, no uh, that even before uh, the um, 
the the war in 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 Ukraine no provided some uh, some you know, some problems no um Viktor Orban's party no uh has uh, retains a two thirds majority in parliament no and again it's a right wing party no um but this all indicates no that within europe no within uh, european society you still have the seeds of um uh, uh, of this unity if you will no um that is a to a large extent a reaction to no um i guess the idea of what a uh, of, of what a united europe is supposed to be no open no um uh, uh, welcoming of uh, uh welcoming of uh, uh, migrants no the free movement of people, goods, and, and, and so on, that is supposed to be part of the European uh, uh, project. No? Um, but Poland and Hungary had been at the front line of the opposition to that kind of liberal policies. No? Um, but now, no? and uh, despite, I, I think arguably, despite the, uh, the unity within, uh, uh, within Europe no, that has been forced upon it by, by uh, uh, a common concern with Russia and its invasion of the Ukraine. No, we, um, I think those issues are still part of no uh, uh, of, of Europe. In, in other words, whether or not this issue is going to be uh, resolved no uh, 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 shortly or over the long term. No, um, these are issues that Europe will have to actually contend with. No, uh, in 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 the future, right? Um, Second is, of course, the continued dominance of Germany in economic policy making in the EU, an issue no, that I think um, uh, is problematic for many uh, countries. No, um, the joke that goes around is that, yes, no, Germany was defeated in two world wars, no, but no, see where it is now, right? Uh, it, meaning to say that it dominates Europe precisely because of its economic uh, position uh, within Europe. No? Um, and yet, no, um, it has received quite a bit of criticism for its fiscal conservatism no, and its energy policies, which has allowed uh, uh, Russia to have a position no, of uh, uh, influence no, um, in, in, uh, 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 in European politics, precisely because of you know, po projects like Nord Stream, for instance. Right? Um, so the other point that, about Europe that we have to take into consideration is NATO. Right, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization was established no, uh, in 1947 with the express uh, uh, express uh, 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 point no, that it is supposed to be all about trying to make sure that um, uh, the Soviet Union would not be able to extend no, uh, its influence no, beyond those countries that it actually occupied no, uh, post Second World War. Okay, um, with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. No, NATO was an alliance in search of some sort of identity, no purpose, no. Um, um, but the I the the irony now is that it's back to its original purpose, right? And and I think to a large extent, the expansion, no, of of NATO was precisely um, uh, uh, pushed by the idea that the, the countries joining, no, felt that. Russia was the principal threat to their security. No? So you're talking about no, uh, the Baltic states, no? Poland, Hungary, no? Romania, and therefore the influence no? uh, that these countries had no? in terms of strengthening NATO. For all its right-wing policies, no? Poland is still one of the strongest supporters of NATO within, uh, uh, within the European uh, uh, Union. No? Um, and now we, we we see the application of Sweden and Finland no, as a consequence of no, uh, again the uh, uh, invasion of Russia no, uh, uh, of Ukraine, and Biden, uh, uh, president of NATO, um, uh, uh, from from what used to be a situation where it was in search of some sort of identity, not to one where there is a clear purpose no, for why NATO needs to continue. No? Um, but this map no, tells us no, precisely where it is that the Russians are actually concerned about, right? Looking at no, Belarus, no, and then of course, to the west, uh, to the east of Ukraine is of course, Russia itself. The idea that the entire uh, uh, that, that uh, a significant part of Russia's border no, was a border that, was, that it had in common with NATO uh, 
uh, countries, no, and and therefore the sense that this is actually a source of threat, no, uh, uh, to to Russia, and therefore what we were talking about earlier on, no, uh, for its sense of security regarding buffer zones, no, uh, and and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, as a geopolitical uh, 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 rationale, no, for what's actually ha happening in the Ukraine right now. Okay. So Sorry, Herman, five, uh, more, five more minutes, yeah? Yes, thank you, uh, Dina. Um, um, is, of course, the United States, no? Um, I'll go through this very quickly, no? U.S. commitment to oppose Russian invasion, no? Uh, uh, can be seen in the massive sanctions directed against uh, Russia and its leadership and support for the Ukraine, no? In terms of um, assistance, no? Legislated by Congress. This is actually quite interesting because in the interim strategic uh, review of uh, that the Biden administ administration came out with uh, a few months after uh, it won the elections uh, uh, last year, um, was the idea that the main strategic competitor for the United States was actually China, right? Russia was mentioned, but more of uh, 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 of a limited threat, not to the United States, no, um, in areas that are what we would refer to, no, as slow intensity uh, uh, efforts, no, or even we will, what we might actually consider or refer to, no, um, as as gray zone tactics, for instance, no, and that's in cybersecurity, security, no, uh, and uh, in in, um, uh, in in political um, uh, operations, no, uh, against the United States. No, but in the wake of this, no, um, the United States has actually become more sensitive, not to what is going on in the Indo-Pacific, right? This has been a co continuing uh, concern, but the concern was that the U.S. would actually be too distracted, no, by what is going on in uh, in Ukraine. But what they are now, uh, what the Biden administration is trying to show is that no, it's not that it will continue uh, its presence in, in the region no, uh, through uh, the Quad and the formation of AUKUS no, as, as, as uh, uh, arrangements that are actually intended to allow the United States no, through its allies to strengthen its alliances no, and project power no, together with its allies no, in an area where it feels no, uh, China is becoming much more influential no, uh, and uh, uh, more more extensively engaged no, in, in a strategic competition with the, with the United States. No? So this is the Indo-Pacific region. No? Um, and this brings us into, of course, the, 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 um, uh, 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 the point with ASEAN, the, the idea of, uh, of the United States wanting to increase its partnership with ASEAN. No? Um, but there's a sort of discongruence, if you will, about uh, U.S. Uh, uh, objectives and that of ASEAN, as indicated in the ASEAN outlook on the in the Pacific, right? Where ASEAN wants to actually um, uh, intensify, you no know, ASEAN centrality, the idea of trying to reduce rivalries, you no, know, and therefore actually getting in between what is the in, the the dominant relationship in the uh, in the Pacific right now, you no, know, which is the competition between China and and the United States. So there's a sort of this congruence no, in, in that, that has to be fixed up no, um, uh, if, if the United States wants to actually intensify its cooperation with, with, with ASEAN. No? So this is pretty much a, 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 a picture of the uh, noodle bowl of multilateral arrangements no? uh, that defines the security uh, and regional architecture no? uh, in, 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 in the region. No? Um, but it raises the question of Despite the fact that um, uh, the United States emphasizes ASEAN centrality, is ASEAN still no, in the driver's seat? No? It seems to me that increasingly the Indo-Pacific strategy of the United States, no, um, while rhetorically talking about no, uh, the importance of, um, of, of ASEAN, is really looking at not so much alternative, but what the United States wants to present no, as com com complementary arrangements no, through the Quad, no, uh, as well as with AUKUS, right? Um, so we're still talking about the idea of upgrading the U.S.-ASEAN relationship, not to a level of comprehensive strategic partnership, no, um, which would be at least symbolically significant, but might still be problematic in terms of what is it that the United States will really do, no, uh, in terms of its projection of its influence, no, in the region, no. So the idea of 
um, uh, uh, the complications created by the Russia uh, invasion of the Ukraine, you know, as to how, um, uh, how relations between China and the United States actually proceeds you know, uh, in this region. You know, and of course, increasingly the concern about Taiwan you know, as China becomes more active you know, uh, in terms of uh, its assertions you know, uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, Taiwan's uh, foreign relations you know, with, other, with other countries in the region, right? Um, world order, last point, right? Um, and I think we can actually say that the liberal or world order that was shepherded by the United States post Second World War and then into the aftermath of the end of the Cold War you know, remains in, uh, in place, you no, know, but is not only unchallenged, uh, uh, no longer unchallenged, you no, know, but increasingly there's a flux in terms of where we're actually going. No, the prospects that we're talking about no, is a return to a Cold War duopoly with the central arena in, uh, in the Indo-Pacific no, that sees the um, competition between China and the United States playing itself out. Or no, the idea of a multipolar world order, no, um, but that multipolar world order no, um, seems to me um, uh, 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 something that, that will be dominated by the the, the relationship between China and, and, and the United States no, for many years to come. So um, this is where I stop no, with, with my presentation, but let me just end with the point that I think what we are seeing is that um, the, the invasion of the Ukraine is just an indication of this shifting world order that we're actually seeing, right? Um, but to say or to see that where it is actually going no, is actually very unclear at this point in time, as I've been emphasizing at the start. No, the main problem is that everything is still in flux right now. No, um, and how it's going to be settled no, um, uh, is something that is unclear at this point in time. We hope no, that somehow peaceful, no, peaceful relations will actually uh, uh, dominate no, the way that we try to shape no, uh, uh, the emer emerging world order, but the conflict in the Ukraine right now no, um, actually creates a situation where um, seeking out no, a, 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 um, uh, a peaceful arrangement no, would be much more difficult no, uh, at this point in time. Right? So thank you very much, no, uh, and I'd be more than happy to um, answer questions that might arise later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Herman. Very uh, comprehensive and very uh, sharp. I think chronologically, you do it um, very nicely, uh, detailed, and yet also provocative. Uh, I would like to highlight several things before I, uh, I move on to the first discussion. I think what's important to uh, highlight from Herman's presentation was that uh, his last point that this uh, world order, we are now witnessing a world order uh, in the making. It's still in flux, whether it will end up peaceful or not. Uh, at the end of the day, we still see the trend to go duopoly, but who knows, this may be a start to a multipolar world order. We see power play becomes uh, very significant as, as a factor driving the US and European countries. And ASEAN is still see here as having a congruence of interest with the US, thus the approach of the US to improve the ASEAN-US strategic partnership. Um, and thank you for pinpointing also the issues inside of Europe, Poland, Hungary, Germany. I'm sure our next experts um, will will comment on that, will uh, reflect on that. I would like now to invite our first discussion, Dr. Julius Purwadi Hermawan, or Julius Purwadi Hermawan, PhD. He is known as Pak Pur, or Mas Pur, the board of expert of uh, the Association of International Relations. He is from uh, Department of uh, International Relations at the University of Parahyangan in Bandung. He is also a senior consultant to various ministries in Indonesia and government agencies. He is now serving as the co-chair of the G20 Sherpa. 
So it's very appropriate uh, to have uh, Pak Julius or Pak Pur with us. Pak Pur, are you ready? <laughs> okay, let's uh, give the screen to you for the next 10 minutes. Silakan Pak Pur. Okay, uh, thank you very much indeed, Ibu Dina. Uh, can I share on my PPT? Okay, excellent. So uh, thank you very much indeed for a very inspiring hang on, uh, speech, of course. Uh, I share a lot of agreement with you, uh, your view, your perspective on many things. And at the end, I guess uh, we need to pursue cooperation yeah, between Indonesian scholars and also Philippine, uh, Philippine uh, scholars. Uh, uh, but really the context of uh, the uncertainties yeah, in this uh, kind of situations. Uh, yes, I agree that uh, uh, everything is still in flux. Uh, we are witnessing the shifting of international system. And then the peaceful arrangement is much more difficult to make at this time. Okay, uh, but allow me also to share my reflections on the Russian and uh, Ukrainian conflict. And uh, this really great opportunity for me. Thank you, Ibu Dina, for uh, inviting me to join the first Critical Mind program of the association. And of course, we will fully support uh, for the productive discussions among scholars, uh, including students here. Okay, uh, five lessons that I, my reflections come from uh, uh, observations towards the crisis, uh, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. But of course, after listening to the presentation by Professor Herman Edman Krapp, which is very excellent. The first meaning, uh, the first lesson is, uh, I think I have to redefine my understanding about the true meaning of European integration. Uh, of course, uh, began in 1949, uh, if we are talking about security integrations through NATO. Uh, and then began 1957, when we talk about uh, integration, economic integration through the establishment of the European Union. And everybody learns that why European Union, uh, European need integrations because of the war. They learn from the war that integration is the answer, the best solution to create peace in Europe, either through, uh, particularly through uh, European Union. And you know now, uh, what does the meaning of European integration actually? Yes, my understanding is will be very easy now that integrations mean inclusion of many, as many as possible of European countries, but with the exception of one or two. You know what I mean? And understanding this definition of integration, the rationale behind the war is easy to understand. Russia has no prospect to be part of either NATO and European Union. And we, if we look at the map clearly, uh, clearly, and let's let's see European Union establishment and then enlargement. Yeah, recruit more members from European countries, of course. But in the end, we know when the integration will stop. Of course, when all or most of European countries will join European Union and then NATO, but maybe two or three countries will be excluded, or four countries will be excluded. That's the first thing. Yeah, look at the NATO, the same, the same case, inclusion, but at the same time, also exclusions. That's the first lesson. Thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, Herman. And then the second is the third party's influence in Europe. Uh, of course, the United States, we understand, uh, really, really has strong interest and patience uh, to maintain its influence in Europe. I must have found that actually there is strong interest to recruit Russia in the regional integration process. We are talking about oil. We are talking dependence of European countries on Russian oil. And now we also learn about the wheat, fertilizers, and what else? Uh, so many things. 
So that's actually strong reasons to recruit Russia in the future, even though we don't know when actually the future what we mean. But unfortunately, unfortunately, the strong reason is always the good reason for sharing the common destiny. And many, many European countries, because of the influence of the third party, perceive Russia is another Europe. And because Russia is not is another Europe, it's not good reasons to recruit Russia. Uh, yes, the third party really unhappy, seems to be unhappy if the integration of the whole Europe will truly happen. Those the party will maintain the mental map of the Russia as another Europe. Even, I think, Budina is quite right. There is no really united voice in response to uh, the Russian-Ukraine uh, conflict between European Union members and also Europe, uh, European, uh, sorry, NATO members. German and France are leading uh, focal points which speak differently. But unfortunately, look, for many reasons, Germany and France cannot fully balance the influence of the third party, which is United States. Budina, here's the third lesson. Uh, Europe may not have fully learned from the first and the second world war and the previous wars. For years, for centuries, uh, we learned that so many wars in Europe. And uh, building the partnership was the key to standing peace. But unfortunately, if Europe keeps hostility with the few, which I mean the excluded, then Europe shall get prepared with the war. The fourth lesson. And of course, ASEAN. ASEAN is very well known as an association which is good in conflict management, which means avoiding the conflict, but not resolving the conflict. Yeah, uh, of course, this perspective can be a good thing or bad thing. But the problem is, if you're looking at how ASEAN members respond to uh, the conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine, they are not divided, uh, sorry, they are not unified either. See, in the United Nations, uh, Indonesia, Kamboja, Brunei, Darussalam, Malaysia are in different views with Laos and Vietnam. When United Nations members are discussing about a resolution in the special session of General Assembly. And, and, sec uh, and the second resolution also, uh, they saw different uh, perspective on that. And also the third resolution on suspension of Russia from Human Rights Council. Philippines uh, in favor, and both Indonesia abstain. Uh, well, ASEAN is divided. And this quite, well, I, I'm this um, tomorrow question, is good or bad. But the future of ASEAN should be determined by ASEAN. The future of ASEAN shall not be determined by the party. The same thing as what's happening in Europe. And it's a big question that will be interested uh, for me to work together with you, uh, Professor Herman, in the future, will ASEAN let the superpower and ally to maintain what the potential threat from the third part in Southeast Asia. And we understand that the United States and its allies in the world building a perceptions about the threat and the threat is just like real for ASEAN members. In that question, is ASEAN still in the a uh, uh, driver's seat? I'm not certain about that. Uh, first, I think you're quite right that we are witnessing, witnessing the geopolitical reconfiguration. Definitely, yes, I agree with you. Some scholars from South America even believe that there is now emerging what we call as the post-Western world order, which uh, signal the end of the dominance of uh, the West in the global uh, uh, order. With the rise of China, of course, one of the uh, important players in this. And this is something worrying, but Herman, Professor Herman, I'm, I do believe maybe ASEAN is still in the driver's seat, but the seat is very hot, unfortunately, at the moment. And uh, yeah, it is some scholar from China actually have tried to sketch some you know, possible uh, kind of the architecture of. Uh, global international system, uh, global system at the moment. Of course, from the bad thing and of course uh, from maybe the fair thing. Uh, Budina, that's my point. I think I'm looking forward to work together with uh, Professor Herman in the future. Thank you yes, very much. thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad that you find the synergy in what you 
uh, understand about the issue and what Professor Herman is uh, seeing. And let's talk uh, about the future of this, yeah? It's interesting. Thank you for the five lessons. Um, we see a different aspect of uh, how Europe deal with the crisis. And um, you are more pessimistic about how ASEAN deals with it. But I can understand that. I can understand that. Later on, as uh, during the um, discussion, we can also talk about how the uh, role of China in the region perhaps affect how ASEAN would also respond. Because somehow the elephant in ASEAN room <laughs> has not yet been talked about. Uh, I'm sure Pai Muhadi has a, also provoking thoughts uh, to what Professor Herman has raised and what you have raised. Pak Muhadi uh, has always been thoughtful as a member of Association of International Relations of Indonesia. He is a faculty member of Gajah Mada University in Yogyakarta. Uh, and note this, very important, he is also the chair and the co coordinator, as well as the founder of the Indonesian Community for European Studies, uh, or Kike. So um, his life should be about European zooming in yeah, into European issues. So his field of expertise has been on theories of IR, peace and security, and then Europe. So it's very timely to hear from uh, your reflection, uh, Bapak Muhadi. The screen is yours. Dibuka dulu, Pak, mikrofonnya. Thank yeah. you very much, Budina, for inviting me uh, to this uh, very important uh, meeting. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, very comprehensive and uh, thoughtful, Professor uh, Herman Kraft, as well as Pak Purwadi. I just would like to add uh, what uh, Pak Purwadi has said, especially focusing on Europe and then uh, with the reflection on the Southeast Asia. Yeah. So uh, in 1993, uh, Two scholar, uh, Aaron Fidowski and uh, I think uh, Mark Singer, uh, presented uh, a published a book following the end of Cold War, uh, dividing uh, the world into two zones. The one is the zones of peace, and the, one, the other is zone of turmoil. The zone of peace uh, referred to areas in the northern part of the globe, including, of course, Europe, where prosperity, democracy are uh, uh, the rule of the game. But the other uh, uh, part of the world is signified by uh, turmoil, conflict, uh, hunger, and so on and so on. But what happened uh, early uh, this year indicates that uh, this division of uh, the world into zone of peace and zone of turmoil does not make any sense any longer. Uh, conflict returned to Europe. Why I said return to Europe? Because uh, Europe has been uh, part of the region full of conflict for a long, long time. It was only after the Second World War uh, then Europe enjoyed uh, significant progress in terms of uh, peace, stability, economic prosperity, and so on and so on. And the problem with uh, Europe today is, in fact, uh, there are two different things that pa Purwadi has also mentioned, uh, ideas that rule uh, the political order in Europe. One is the situation, and the other is exclusion. The European Union represents uh, the idea of solving the problem of conflict in Europe through cooperation, engaging, involving even former uh, enemies, Germany, into the alliance, into the uh, organization called the European Union. And it has been successful. And on the other hand is uh, the establishment of NATO, where uh, most of the EU member countries are actually part of the NATO member. And this has quite different idea, different uh, uh, rationale from the European Union. Uh, but for mention exclusion, it's the rule of the NATO. And this exclusionary character of the NATO is getting worse uh, in the last uh, years. So, and this become 
uh, the more important cause of uh, instability in Europe. And unfortunately, the second tendency, uh, the exclusion, is getting stronger and stronger with the uh, involvement of the third party. That is the US, according to, uh, in the word of Pak Purwadi. Now, I would like to uh, give you some ideas of what I, I'm thinking about uh, what uh, happened in the Europe now. Can we move to the next slide, please? So what I'm afraid, as the conflict in Ukraine enter into the fourth month, we are entering of what so called a protracted, protected conflict. Protected conflict is a complex, severe, and commonly enduring. Without any vision of the end of the conflict in the short time. And there, there, we have so many reasons to believe that the conflict has turned into protected. I will discuss about that later on. Now, as a protected conflict, it will have a very significant consequences. First of all, as we have seen, the human catastrophe, greater death, destruction, displacement ten of tens of thousands of lives. For example, 12 million of Ukraine left their homes. Half of it, uh, half of uh, this number has left the country and infrastructure destruction and uh, it's very, very messy. And if the conflict continues, then the scale of humanitarian crisis will continue and grow. And of course, internationally, the global price rise as well as food shortage can be the consequences of this uh, uh, conflict if the conflict will not end soon. And then more importantly, there is a tendency of broadening and deepening hostile relations, not only among states, but also among nations. And this can be very dangerous and will bring uh, Europe back to the turmoil, like in the past, where uh, hostility, not only uh, among the state, but also the people, create an ending conflict among Europeans themselves. And not to, uh, to forget, every conflict has a possibility of escalation as well as a transformation which make it more and more difficult to resolve politically. The more conflict uh, takes place and resolved, then the more uh, it will escalate and the, it will transform. For example, Sweden and uh, Finland, who, uh, which uh, previously not part of the NATO is now becoming part of the NATO. This is part of the escalation and transformation of conflict. So this is the situation that I'm, uh, uh, fearing of uh, if the conflict in Ukraine uh, will not uh, stop very soon. Next uh, slide, please. Now, how to break this impasse? This is very important. There is no way in which we can uh, avoid uh, protracted conflict except by stopping the war and break diplomacy back to the state, okay? This is the must, uh, something that have to be done. Unfortunately, the way to break the impasse is not going to be easy. Take a look at the two possibilities that we can have to stop the conflict. First, international response using military power, but backed by international law to stop or to cripple Russian uh, forces, okay? This is not something that does not have any precedent. There are many precedents in international relations, Korea. Assuming that Russia was invited by legitimate government in Syria, and this can also be done. But the risk is, of course, very, very significant. It can lead to uh, serious consequence leading to the Third World War, involving uh, nuclear uh, weapons. The second one. The second possible way of stopping the war is pursuing an immediate ceasefire. And again, 
This is not unprecedented in international relations. But the very success of this option depends on the ability to pursue Putin. Just once again, working with instead of confronting Russia or Putin is a very, very significant. The West should persuade Putin rather than confronting Putin. Unfortunately, this is not the way that the Western under the US has opted. Instead of pursuing Putin to stop the aggression, the uh, prefer to arm the Ukraine giving the military supplies and support. Next. Now, the fact that the third party exists in the conflict, the US, created the problem. Papur also identified already the problem with the US as the third party in the European politics. If we go back to the European experience, own experience, I will two different ways in which the European solved the problem. One is the Congress of Vienna. It took place early in the early 19th century, following the defeat of Napoleon. The Congress led to the emergence of what so-called Concert of Europe, which brought peace for almost one uh, century in Europe. Basically, the Concert of Europe is a mechanism of uh, preserving order in which the issues of war and peace were consulted among all the big powers. Every big power was consulted, including the friends, former enemies of everyone in Europe at the time. So again, the lesson from Europe is inclusion is more uh, beneficial than exclusion. As I mentioned here, the most important lesson from Congress of Vienna is that the peace negotiation took place with the spirit of rebuilding political order in Europe by inviting all the big power, including the aggressor, the friends. And the second lesson from Europe is the Treaty of Versailles. It took place a century after the Congress of Vienna following the First World War. But it was far from peace negotiation, as the negotiation process was determined by the victors of the war. Consequently, the process ending with punishing, weakening, and impoverishing Germany. The dissatisfaction with the peace treaty has led to the emergence of such populist leader as Hitler and brought Europe to another war not long after the First World War ended. And I'm afraid that the current situation tends to resemble the second way of looking at uh, how the conflict in Ukraine will be solved. Because the West under the US tend to see you, uh, Russia as an enemy and should be punished and should be impoverished with so many ways. While on the other hand, arming Russian military, arming uh, uh, Ukrainian fighter to combat Russia. So this choice must be made very, very soon. Otherwise, the conflict will be unbearable, not only for Europe, but also for uh, international community as a whole. And back to our and uh, our yard in Southeast Asia or in the Pacific, I think the strategy that the US is also uh, is using in Europe will be utilized also in uh, Asia Pacific. But uh, instead of uh, Russia, now China is uh, the target. So uh, ASEAN need to stay firm that we should not be uh, corner into such a difficult choices. And of course, the war in Ukraine is not only, uh, not the war between Russia and the rest of the world, because it is really uh, Russia and the West under the US. If you look at India, it's not part of it, and very critical to the position of the US, uh, Saudi Arabia, and Latin American countries, and so on and so on. So we have to be very careful and don't be drugged 
into the rhetoric of like uh, the rhetoric used by the US in the past uh, uh, in the construction of enemy by saying you and us, uh, they mm -hmm. and us. Okay, thank you very much, Budina. Thank you very much, Pak Muhadi. A very provoking uh, reflection. Uh, very useful to see uh, deeper into Europe. You're indeed uh, very uh, well known for that. Um, so a couple of things we can take uh, out from this first uh, part of the dialogue. Yeah, uh, We can see how uh, everybody's agree. Uh, the three speakers and the speakers and the discussion, the panelists agree that uh, there's a third party <laughs> driving, uh, not just, you know, accidentally be in the conflict, but driving the entire dynamics of the situation between Russia and Ukraine, namely the United States. And um, the second point is that uh, the situation is still dire, uh, basically. We can see that um, it still go either way, but the chance for peace seems to be more and more minuscule as uh, sanctions and isolations are trying to be imposed to Russia uh, to the point that uh, this kind of exclusion may actually provoke uh, bigger uh, retaliation yeah, from, from Russia and who knows uh, what will be the, the new, you know, the new actor that provoke, that's, uh, that, that will be provoked to come in into the, to the conflict. A uh, very important question was raised by Pak Muhadi as well about the ceasefire. Uh, of course, we all want immediate ceasefire, but the question is how, from who, how, uh, what kind of acceptable uh, terms will be, uh, will be made and who would propose it to make it uh, you know, believable and uh, credible. So a number of issues has been in place. I give you uh, the chance to write your questions in the uh, chat box. Please feel free. While you're thinking of your questions, let me engage the three panelists in a couple of more uh, thought-provoking questions. Yeah. First, uh, Prof. Herman, pa Purwadi and Pa Muhadi, if we look at the, the point that the conflict still has the potential to get worsened, given the signs that power is driving this world order, um, where, where do you see, uh, to be precise, maybe we can sharpen this uh, view about where is the emerging economies, such as Indonesia, the Philippines, um, ASEAN member states, or even the G20 countries who are uh, in the status as emerging economies. Uh, if we see the, uh, the intensification of conflicts yeah, uh, is ongoing, and the fact that these countries has been mentioned as very resource rich, would you see um, the same similar phenomenon like in the past, we may not be engaging directly in the war, but all of our resources will be absorbed uh, to fuel the war, to flame the war? That's the first uh, question. And, and how do we then come into the picture to make sure that we are not uh, worsening the uh, power to power uh, you know, uh, conflicts? Second, I was very intrigued with what uh, Professor Herman mentioned earlier about this perception of congruence between the U.S. objectives on this world order and what the ASEAN may want to, to do for the region. This is uh, quite troublesome in my view, uh, despite the fact that President Joko Widodo, for instance, keeps saying that, look, come back to the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. It's not the same with Quad, it's not the same with AUKUS, it's not the same with the U.S. agenda. But still, uh, it's not uh, remini you know, it's not resonating. Same thing with what uh, the Philippine president was saying, right? He was so sick about about uh, dealing with the U.S. that he decided to just stop talking to the U.S. So, how how to deal uh, with this uh, third party um, player, yeah, actor, which happened to be quite significant in the region? 
uh, but you know, uh, confronting with such a big power is also not within our best interest if it uh, will lead to open war with us, for instance. So uh, I would like to hear some uh, further reflection from uh, all the panelists. Who wants to start first? Professor Herman, you want to start first? Uh, yes, Dina, but, but can you repeat your, fir your first question? Um, I was trying to um, think about it, but but um, mm -hmm. I, I lost the train when when uh, you went back to you, you went the to US. the second question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the first question was about uh, countries like us, Indonesia, Philippines, resource-rich countries, and also G20 countries whose status are emerging economies. So mm. support basically as the source of growth, right, for European countries, for the US. Um, if this power-to-power uh, -power, uh, seeking of balance continue to happen, who would us be to them <laughs> in this thing? Are we going to be extracted, you know, all of our resources there, maybe as uh, Professor, as Pak Muhadi and mm. Pak uh, Julius mentioned, Pak Purwadi mentioned, maybe we'll be in deep misery, the South. <laughs> we'll repeat having that situation, taking away all the development uh, fruits that we have uh, grown uh, in the past few decades. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, going to your first question, um, um, the problem I think with the sanctions and the war itself, right? I mean, um, one, one of the questions that actually come come out of this is the idea of um, are we going to be affected directly by the conflict, right, uh, in terms of uh, the economic uh, uh, implications, right? Distance shows that, or at least indicates that directly, no, right? But this is the, here's the point. Um, like it or not, Europe actually constitutes a very, very important part of all our trade, here in this region and for emerging economies, I think that's that's an important part. Um, and the question that we have to actually understand is how is the European economy going to be affected by this conflict? And that's a much more direct uh, 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 consequence, right? Um, so you're talking about a number of things. Um, number one, the obvious thing is, of course, oil and gas, no? uh, the, the, the effect of sanctions no, on Russia and how that actually affects the economies of uh, uh, Western Europe, Germany in particular, right? So in this context, they have to look for alternative sources of energy, you know, which will actually drive up the costs of uh, uh, energy sources, which will affect us as well as far as our production uh, uh, capabilities are concerned. So there is going to be that kind of um, spillover as far as supply chains are actually concerned you know, uh, in, in terms of production. Um, and, and, and so inevitably we are going to be affected, you no, know, um, the kinds, and, and that's going to be something that will happen, uh, over, I think what Pamuhadi was actually say, uh, talking about, you no, know, especially if this conflict becomes more protracted, right? So we're going to feel the effects, you no, know, of, of these kinds of, uh, disruptions, you no, know, in, in, in the global economy, you no, know, uh, um, down the line. And, and so I think it's going to, uh, at, at some point actually affect us. Um, th uh, I think somebody mentioned the issue of, I, I think it was Pai Yulius, uh, who talked about the idea of uh, global prices going up, no, especially food uh, uh, food resources, right? And, and you're talking about the idea of wheat uh, as, an, as, as a basic commodity for, for all of this, right? Um, and, and so that means you'll have to find much more uh, 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 alternative sources of wheat. They might be there, but they're farther right? Um, Australia, for instance, Canada, you know, uh, and, and so, which basically means, you know, transport will actually increase the prices of all of these uh, things, you know, and, and will have an effect on, on the way that we look at the, um, uh, the efficiency of the uh, uh, global economy. So I, I think over the, over the long, uh, over the short term, we're going to start feeling the impact of the conflict on the global economy, especially as far as supply chains are actually concerned particularly on very basic uh, uh, products like gas, oil, no, uh, energy sources, no, and then, of course, uh, 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 food production. Um, so that, that's going to affect us down the line in, in terms of our own. The second point has to do with this lack of congru uh, 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 convergence, no, uh, congruence between uh, U.S. And, and, and ASEAN. Um, 
uh, ASEAN wants to continue with the kinds of norms that it has actually promoted uh, under uh, the uh, uh, Treaty of Amity and, uh, uh, and Cooperation in Southeast Asia and everything else that has to do with that. And we can all see that in terms of the um, ASEAN outlook on the uh, Indo-Pacific, right? Um, it's a very different thing that the United States no, uh, and uh, its, its, its um, uh, allies under AUKUS no, uh, and its partners in Quad are actually uh, looking for. Now, the, I think the point that I was making uh, when I made pre my presentation was that rhetorically, the United States keeps on talking about the idea of um, uh, supporting ASEAN and supporting ASEAN centrality. The problem is that uh, it's not a question of American support. It's the idea of having all of these alternative arrangements, right, uh, which can actually, uh, which the United States uh, uh, can use and will use, no, um, in a way that will actually undermine, I think, no, uh, the um, ASEAN-driven multilateral uh, uh, um, uh, regional uh, architecture that we actually have at this point in time. Um, I, I, I honestly believe no, that if we're going to try to mitigate, reduce no, the, the more egregious effects of this competition between China and the United States, um, ASEAN has to be more united, must have a more common notion of what the strategic environment looks like, and therefore what kinds of interests ASEAN collectively has to actually protect. No? Unfortunately, I think that's where the problem lies, right? That um, ASEAN is too divided as far as the, how the member countries actually see the strategic environment and where their strategic interests actually lie. The moment you have that kind of division, no, um, then it's much more difficult for ASEAN to act together, uh, much more difficult for us to actually be a much more uh, strategic player in a region that is increasingly dominated by that competition between China and the United States. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Herman, for that uh, intervention. Pa Purwadi? Uh, I guess I can answer the first questions uh, better than the second, and I need time for research for the second one about the position of ASEAN. Uh, OK, uh, but in. In general, I share agreement uh, with uh, uh, Professor Herman. Of course, uh, what are the role of emerging economies in this kind of situations? Uh, yes, it is uh, our concern now because we are hosting G20, uh, where uh, 20 uh, countries will come uh, to Indonesia. Uh, 20 members of G20 will come to Indonesia, and we have to uh, get prepared uh, for the worst, unfortunately, at this time uh, in this context of the situation. Uh, yes, uh, domestic uh, supply chain, I think uh, that's concern of every country now. Yeah. How to ensure that the supply will be sufficient for the whole year. This everybody's talking about. Well, Indonesia also uh, concern, for instance, with the fertilizer now. Uh, fertilizer. We, we used to import from uh, Russia and Ukraine and some other EU countries. Uh, uh, and what I heard, enough until September. What happened after, after September? Then it will be multiplier effect if we cannot secure uh, the supply of the uh, fertilizer uh, materials, including CPO. I think Indonesia is one of the larger uh, producer of CPO and will be very bad impact if we cannot uh, do that. Uh, that's one and two, but, but this also will be a big challenge. It will be a big challenge for uh, every, every country now. The second is, uh, something what has been happening in advanced countries uh, and the way the government responds uh, to this of the problem, like say inflation. Uh, 8% in the United States, that's crazy. And the way they respond will affect the emerging economies. We cannot avoid that. Get prepared with the fall of rupiah. With that effect, we'll have multiplying effect. So that's something that we need to uh, anticipate. Uh, how, uh, by observing closely what the advanced countries in responding to uh, the crisis, the economic crisis. Uh, that's very important. Uh, coordination between countries, between G20, then 
will be very important. That's why uh, I, I I still continue to argue that Bali G20 uh, G20 summit uh, will be matters matter for both econ for both uh, emerging economies, but also for developed countries. Really, so having the idea not to attend boycotting definitely uh, uh, should be rejected uh, at this time uh, at difficult time. If we can contribute to the uh, to the peace process, that will be good, very good. It will be hard to expect that the block countries bring Russia uh, to the negotiation table. See, Turkey now is playing, trying to playing uh, the role. Uh, Indonesia is still struggling to find that. But ASEAN maybe. Come to the second question. Uh, remember, uh, how could us uh, United States maintain its influence in Europe because they can successfully convince our, our European leaders that the threat was so real in Europe. And without the help of the United States, then there is no peace in Europe. In Europe. But well, this is my argument. Of course, you can uh, disagree with me. So NATO, looking at the NATO, why NATO was established in 1949? Uh, the reason because there was real threat from Soviet Union. And and the perception is still being kept even until WhatsApp uh, uh, already uh, 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 dissolved in 1991. And then until today, even still thinking that there is an enemy, let's work together uh, to build our defense capacity. That's United States in Europe. What's about in Southeast Asia? In Southeast Asia, I think the rhetoric will be the same. The, the way United States try to frame ASEAN members that they meet United States, I think uh, it's quite evident. ASEAN members see you have real, real threat in the regions. Everybody knows uh, whom uh, United States mean by the real threat. Uh, the issue is uh, yes, uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, in this. In this uh, perspective, I will agree with uh, Professor Herman. It's very much divided at the moment. But the most important thing is how can ASEAN play a strategic role? Balancing relationship with the United States, but then also develop a more positive relationship with the real threat. That's my point. Okay, thank you, Pak uh, Purwadi. Uh, Pak Muhadi? Um, microphone, Pak. Maaf. This kind of situation is always very problematic for uh, smaller countries like uh, the uh, emerging countries like Indonesia and so on and so on. But one thing is uh, very clear that as the conflict uh, takes the form of ideological conflict, and uh, I, I believe that the U.S. is trying to uh, characterize Russia and label it as a de democratic and so on and so on, and gather uh, the support from democratic countries. So uh, this is something that uh, uh, we have to be very careful, because in such a situation, the U.S. try to get as many support as possible. And therefore, we should be very firm in saying no to be dragged into this kind of conflict. And India, I saw it very, very stance uh, uh, position in the sense that, no, why should we care a lot about conflict in Europe and the US, which does not uh, uh, fill our interests, even our, it, it uh, jeopardize our interests. So, we should be able to know to this effort to drag into more hostile relations in the international relation. And I think uh, what happened with uh, the pressure to Indonesia not to invite Russia and to blockade if Putin come to the G20 is a good example of how we should try to refuse and uh, resist such kind of temptation. Because uh, 
believe it or not, uh, when we talk about ideology, then it will be brought to uh, Southeast Asia as well, Indo-Pacific as a concept. It's also uh, built upon this assumption that Indo-Pacific is built upon uh, the foundation of democracy and open society and does not include China in this case. It's a very polite way to exclude China. And, ASEAN has a, a right decision to say, no, we should be very inclusive. And the European Union uh, strategy on Indo-Pacific is also uh, in the comparison to uh, ASEAN outlook is quite similar. You would like to see Indo-Pacific as an inclusive way uh, of cooperation. And now the fact that uh, one of the uh, resources that European Union uh, need come from Russia and now it is very difficult to get it from Russia, they look for uh, alternative and uh, the countries, the resource uh, rich countries like Indonesia has uh, gained uh, interest in on the eyes of EU. For example, I read a newspaper yesterday that uh, the demand for steel has increased dramatically from Indonesia. This is a blessing in disguise, but we should not uh, depend our faith only to the blessing. We should try to pursue uh, international relation that can be uh, predictable, uh, can be predicted uh, very nicely uh, as a formal policy formulation. So my uh, idea is that we should try to avoid the temptation to follow uh, being dragged into ideological conflict. And we should say no on that. And I think uh, the meeting between the ASEAN and uh, the US a uh, couple of days ago uh, clearly indicated that the US is still trying to sell the idea to su get support from the ASEAN countries. And I'm glad that ASEAN countries has still uh, very consistent with the idea that no, we should uh, be very consistent. ASEAN should be on the driving seat and so on and so on. Thank you very much. Uh... Bapa Bapa, um, my my own respond to that. I think in general, we are not supposed to just think um, that ASEAN is the only one uh, facing this kind of dilemmas. Yeah, uh, South Asian countries, uh, India, <laughs> Pakistan, yeah. Afghanistan, they are already in worse condition than us. I um, mean, the division among them and the split uh, that is created by third parties among them is really suffocating them at this point in time. So, uh, and speaking about labeling that Pak Muhadi just mentioned, India already get the label now. <laughs> exactly. So it's very unfortunate. Yeah. So we have to be brave, right? Maybe yeah. Yeah. by taking position, as you say, we will be labeled too, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so there's one question from uh, Felix Patrick. Um, one of the students, Felix, please uh, open your mic and... Uh, introduce yourself to the panelist and then please other uh, participants you may also share your observation your reflection and be most welcome you can also do it in bahasa indonesia so i can translate felix You already take notes of that, yeah? So we can move on to the second question and then answer it a bit later. Hendra? Yes, thank you, Mbak Dina. Thank you, Bapak. Nice to meet you. Nice well, meet you. first of all, I, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm a student in Pajajaran University. Okay. So that uh, I think that I would like to raise questions regarding to the possibility of the failure of this kind of the peace situations, peaceful coexistence, which involve the global major power. Well, as we know that, uh, well, uh, I wouldn't take any side whether regarding to the supporting Kiev or Moscow. But this is, of course, regarding to the uh, establishing, uh, developing a new international order which will impact, which will affect 
uh, either, well, directly or indirectly to whole of the regions. I mean, that this is my point of view. Well, of course, as we know that in Southeast Asia also, uh, it has been fragmented. It has been, uh, well, divided. We know that Singapore, have, well, at the first time when Vladimir Putin has already announced regarding to the uh, special military operations on February 24th, uh, 2022, uh, in the early morning at 5.30, we know that, well, the uh, Western countries uh, led by the US and also the European Union, they say that, well, they, they are not worried. I mean that uh, because they still have uh, NATO and they ignore uh, OSCE, uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation uh, in Europe, while the OSCE uh, chairman also met with Vladimir Putin in Kremlin several times, and also that uh, sanctions also has already been given to Russia even since 2014, when we know that uh, this is due to the uh, failure of the Minsk agreements which involve also the uh, global uh, sorry the regional power of european countries at the times uh, france and germany also invited well to solve the problems of the donbas donetsk and also luhans well uh, i would like to well i uh, want to ask about uh, the possibility of the <clears throat> of the what of the meeting uh, in Bali, then Pasar in November, uh, in the end of the November 2022, regarding to there is also big agenda uh, to to arrange meeting, uh, asking Ukraine also invite uh, in the big event G20. While we know that the meeting itself only discuss about the global economic problems and also the crisis, uh, food crisis and energy crisis. Plus also that sustainable energy, uh, well, uh, crisis regarding to the climate change issue. Oh, okay. Well, uh, about that, uh, what, what, what the speaker's uh, perspective on that? Thank you very much, Mbak Dina. Thank you very much. You. So two questions, uh, panelists, uh, to start with. First is about uh, the identity issue. Asia versus Europe, and the second one is about the prospect yeah, of bringing in Ukraine to the table of G20 summit, how will it impact the peaceful coexistence <laughs> between mm -hmm. Russia and Ukraine, if, uh, if anything possible. Uh, Prof. Herman, you want to start? Not really, but uh, I, I guess I will, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, the identity question is actually important, but it's not a zero-sum game, right? Mm -hmm. in, in other words, um, what ASEAN is trying to promote uh, through the, uh, uh, the the Treaty of Amity um, uh, and, and Cooperation uh, and what we talk about in terms of ASEAN values, for instance, no? um, is uh, to, to, to a large extent uh, a way of actually conducting international relations, no? Um, through uh, low-key diplomacy, uh, through uh, peaceful ways of um, uh, dealing with problems, no, and so on. In, in other words, it might be cliche-ish, but that's that's essentially what we talk about when we talk about the idea of uh, um, um, ASEAN values, right? Um, if we're talking about Asian values, no, that's a little bit more problematic, right? <laughs> because there's greater diversity as far as the idea of an Asian identity is actually concerned. Right, um, but when you talk about ASEAN and the notion of ASEAN values, it's really procedural in the way that we conduct our international relations. Right, if that's the case, then um, you have a lot of countries that have signed on to the TAC um, and have agreed to actually, con in, in fact, in the in their participation within the context of the ASEAN-driven multilateral arrangements. No, uh, that includes, of course, the ASEAN Plus Three. No, and EAS no, uh, and, and so on, um, uh, there's pretty much some sort of agreement about how we're supposed to actually deal with these kinds of uh, issues. Okay. Um, the problem is, I think, no, um, uh, again, I'm going back to my theme earlier on, 
that to a large extent, you're, you have emerging relationships and emerging arrangements that are outside of the, uh, 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 the, the um, ASEAN uh, 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 arrangements, right? And therefore have their own dynamic no? and do not necessarily follow the essence of, uh, uh, of, of, of what we have uh, in, in terms of, uh, 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 of the ASEAN way of doing business, for instance. And, and so the problem there is that once you have those in place, so that's quad, no, uh, Ocus, no, uh, uh, and and uh, the different strategies for the Indo-Pacific, right? Um, what you really have is a situation where the way that we've actually tried to set up a regional security architecture this past 20 years is being set aside. And something else, a different dynamic is actually becoming uh, uh, dominant no, in the way that uh, uh, international relations are actually being uh, 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 considered. So um, the idea of identity to a large extent no, um, is, uh, is uh, 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 no longer a matter for, for, for how we're, we're, we're looking at uh, um, uh, international relations being conducted. And in fact, if you will, part of the transition, part of the flux, no, the, 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 the changing uh, uh, relationships no, um, is precisely the search for what, what kind of identity are we now setting up no? uh, as far as the region is actually concerned. No? Uh, and to go back to some of the points that were made by uh, uh, Pa Yulius and Pa Muadi, no? um, the question of inclusiveness and ex exclusiveness. Who's part, who's, who's part of this arrangement and who's not? No? Who should be in and who should be out? No? Mm -hmm. um, part of the ASEAN way is inclusiveness, right? the idea of inclusivity, no? uh, trying to include everyone into the process of dialogue, in the process of actually seeking uh, um, uh, peaceful uh, uh, ways by which we can actually settle uh, um, um, uh, 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 issues. No? Um, but increasingly, no, um, those ways are actually being uh, superseded, if you will, uh, by the fact that you do have different kinds of arrangements no, that are now outside of the ASEAN ways of doing things. And because of that, I think uh, we can see a deeply, deeply, um, uh, a diminution, if you will, no, of, of what used to be the normative arrangements that defined how we actually did uh, uh, work with, 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 with each other. Um, the second question no, has to do with uh, the, the, the question of, can we uh, invite Ukraine to the G20 uh, uh, meeting? Um, I guess so, but the question there is, uh, unless you have Russia there, right? Uh, it's going to be it's going to be very difficult to find some sort of peaceful uh, uh, way of a uh, peaceful way of actually settling the uh, uh, issue in in the Ukraine. I think both discussants mentioned this uh, uh, earlier on that uh, to a large extent. Um, uh, uh, there has to be a way of persuading Putin was actually, I, I think Pamohad was the one who said this, you know, that we need to, the West has to persuade Putin not to, 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 to basically back off, to, to, to uh, agree to some sort of peaceful resolution, to, to talks. No? Um, the problem, uh, I, I would only add to that, no? the issue of, well, you might be able to persuade Putin, but will the Ukrainians actually agree to no, not being consulted no, in that kind of arrangement. You have to have both. There has to be some sort of uh, uh, arrangements where you have both uh, parties actually sitting. No? Um, and so trying to get Ukraine into the G20 while uh, Russia is uh, uh, excluded is going to be a problem. It's, it's again part of this dynamic of exclusion and inclusion, right? That, that, uh, that I think is part of this problem, uh, 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 of the problems that we're actually facing right now. Thank okay, you. thank you, thank you, uh, Prof. Herman. Pak Pur. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, thank you for the question, Felix. And yes, uh, uh, I found that uh, the Asian panel is very important, and this is very powerful. Could be strength point, the strong point of ASEAN. Uh, who could I say? say? Uh, who could I say that? I think you agree with me that uh, uh, the value, the ASEAN value and the identity has already solidified the ASEAN members. 
simple example is there is no war between Indonesia and Philippines, and I don't think there will be war between Indonesia and Philippines. Yeah, the more we meet in Zoom meeting even like this, then I think we will avoid uh, such time of catastrophe because of the war. That's one thing which is very powerful: the powerful of uh, the power of the values uh, solidify internally. But quite interesting also to note that uh, to highlight is that uh, ASEAN is also in good position when dealing with or having dialogue with ASEAN partners, ASEAN dialogue partners. They have to ratify our TAC first before ASEAN gives them the status as the status as ASEAN dialogue partner. Then we will have summit. So, so the summit that we have in the United States is built on ASEAN value. That's one thing I think is also very important. So what's the value actually uh, means and implication of the value? No intervention uh, principle. You know. People, many people think this already obsolete. But I think this also, uh, uh, in my perspective, you know, uh, not really obsolete. Uh, we have, uh, we shall you know, learn from the history of the world. When we're talking about whether the, uh, the value is really obsolete or not, but the problem then, uh, the problem then there is still something that we have to do to strengthen the value. I think that's that's very important. For instance, we haven't achieved a kind of the true or genuine community sense of community in ASEAN. We feeling, uh, I, my and I. Yeah, if we we uh, we met in 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 Europe, for instance, no one in Europe maybe will think I am uh, Indonesian. Maybe they will ask, "Are you Philippine?" As the Pak Herman, something like. Uh, but the feeling is not established yet. We, uh, even though in paper, we already declare that we the citizen of ASEAN. So how to make you no know, uh, the value, the normative value, or even the principle because we already adopted functioning well, uh, including how we can respond to the external issues. That's something uh, very important. Sales with big agenda for that. Dina already in ASEAN, I think knows uh, very well about that. But let's build optimism too, yeah. Uh, or at least skepticism, you know, not uh, uh, pessimism on that issue. In Bali, uh, definitely we'll invite uh, Ukraine. Uh, we already sent invitation to uh, Russia in February, and Indonesia uh, uh, doesn't change its mind, or will not change its mind to cancel the invitation. Uh, Sandra. Yes, I think you're right. The agenda is already stick with you know three uh, three pillars of you know, uh, primary issues. You're quite right. Uh, the summit actually function more or less symbolical, <laughs> symbolically, since 2008. Usually they just declare what they already agreed. So you know that only hundred, maybe there will be only uh, already hundred fifty meetings, previous meetings at the working groups, minister level. So total two hundred lah. Yeah. Then before the summit, there will be negotiation between Serpa, of course, uh, G20 Serpas, and agree on the draft of declarations. Yes. Can we include this agenda? Maybe very hard. It will be very hard for that. Yeah, because uh, particularly if it is uh, included in the last minute, me, uh, in the last minute. Yeah. But what I can say actually, uh, there is still al always room of opportunity to give G20 a value added, a value added, not simply a, a forum or not a simply a meeting where the leaders declare. The commitments, but more than that, uh, um, no, no, Indonesian presidency is not preparing for different uh, scenario, uh, Mas Hendra. Yeah. Uh, how can uh, first uh, uh, G20 summit be successful? Successful in the sense that there is declaration, that's very important, because we are worried that there will be no declarations, and it could, could happen, actually, it could happen. If United States leaders, uh, Joe Biden decided not to go gitu, and decided not to get involved in negotiation before the this summit, this is something we have to avoid. Uh, I don't know uh, whether it will be happening, but so far still okay, Masendra. Gitu. Negotiation still uh, there. Gitu. 
there are perspective of G20 still talking about the uh, main issues and hopefully you know, for the summit we have uh, declarations to be adopted i'm i'm sure you know, yeah one proposal will say about condemning invasion i'm sure you know. but there will be a reservation by china of oh, the world will be changed so we are concerned with geopolitical tension which is much more generic without mentioning russia and ukraine but one thing that i really uh, interested you know, uh, to suggest is that there is commitment by russia and other leaders to help ukrainian leaders to rebuild their countries it will take 15 years 18 years but of course the general support which will be declared declared in the G20 summit in bali will be very important budina hmm thank you very much uh, pak purwadi pak muhadi silakan bapak thank you very much yeah uh, the the concept of identity is uh, with regard to asean is getting even more difficult today uh, and much more complicated than we thought as we thought before so uh, in the past we 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 believe that asean identities can be associated with ethnicities. but this is not uh, the case any longer uh, i think uh, not many uh, if not all uh, leaders in southeast asia would like to uh, pursue the idea of asean values as strongly as the previous leaders like uh, suharto mahadev and you Now uh, the word uh, identity can refer to different things in case of ASEAN. It can be referred to ASEAN values like in the past, but it can be like uh, what Pak Pur said uh, in the document of ASEAN can be uh, associated with ASEAN ways of doing business of ASEAN mechanism and so on and so on. And more recently, uh, the ASEAN summit adopted what so called the ASEAN identity. which is uh, quite different from the asian value because it include all values of democracy and so on and so on and so on so uh, it, it is changing so uh, talking about the values uh, in its specific form of asian values uh, is difficult to understand how asean is dealing uh, with other uh, partner in international relation so uh, it is much more uh, convenient is much easier for us to talk about asean ways of doing uh, business in relation to the asean member countries themselves and uh, asean relations with the third parties so the tac for example as pa herman mentioned pa pur also mentioned is clearly the reflection of the asean values in international relation of asean now with regard to the uh, presence of uh, Ukraine in the, the G20 summit. I think this is a, a good opportunity for the G20 to be very successful by inviting uh, 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 Ukraine, which otherwise it has been uh, kidnapped uh, by the fact that uh, the country would not attend the meeting if russia uh, attend the meeting but now the uh, indonesia uh, seem to be very happy to to avoid this uh, impasse by inviting ukraine as well now uh, the next question is how we put ukraine in the context of g20 and of course uh, the Uh, joint statement uh, the doc- final document has been prepared long time ago a uh, long time before the summit so uh, there is nothing to do for the head of the uh, countries attending the uh, g20 to formulate the statement so what i i think they can do is spending some time outside the formal arrangement the formal agenda to talk about uh, the situation heart to heart and without uh, uh, being very hostile to each other and build the uh, uh, the solution to the problem because i believe that russia does not have any exit strategy okay russia is already exhausted with the conflict in ukraine but it does not have any exit strategy 
which can also uh, face saving for Russia, for Putin, and so on and so on. So the West should be able to help Russia to exit without being humiliated. So in this case, uh, Macron is uh, correct in saying that we should not humiliate Putin because if uh, Russia is in the desperate situation, Putin was uh, being cornered and desperate, then everything can happen. It can rely on the nuclear weapon as the last resort to bring back its confidence and pride. So uh, I, I still really uh, like to refer to the Eastern identity, Eastern philosophy as expressed by Sun Tzu. If you would like to defeat your enemy, build a golden bridge for the enemy so that they can exit very, very brightly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, in terms of um, ASEAN identity, I think um, it's, it's much more nuanced, yeah? We cannot quite talk about all the layers of how ASEAN identity has been tried and 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 promoted inside of ASEAN, but yet the issue of this has been raised in the Bali Concord too, right? All this identity of communities uh, spelled out by each pillar. But uh, let me let me draw your attention to the issue of political security. Uh, 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 pillar, for instance, I think which is very relevant here. Ideally, this should be aligned, right? All this common identity in the political security pillar should help us then becoming more strategic in the fora, in the global fora. But um, pursuing human rights, pursuing democracy, pursuing it's it has been a, a very big homework for ASEAN. Uh, not necessarily at the government level, but also between government and civil society. So. Yeah, it's a it's a it's an issue for ASEAN. There's one more question, but I would like to uh, give the freedom to the panelists, uh, which one of you would respond because we still we have only a few more minutes left. The question is from wait is from Derby Derby Yudisti Johan from Parahyangan University. Um, Derby, you wish to raise your question? On your own, Derby? Or should I just read it? Okay, I should just read it. So the question is, uh, will the Russian-Ukraine conflict get worse if somehow the NATO members will join the war against uh, Russia? Or this remains uh, impossible to happen given the risk of um, of doing this to uh, European countries? What is the likelihood that the rest of Europe may join in and, and actually open bigger war in bigger, bigger front yeah, in Europe? Who wants to answer? Can I answer? Boleh, Pak Muadi, silakan. Yeah, uh, if we look at the current situation, we can be misled as if the EU, European countries are in line, uh, in agreement, unified under the US. But this forget the division within the European Union itself. So in Europe itself, they are very fragmented and cannot be uh, taken for granted that they will always uh, behind the US if the situation continue and getting mm. worse. So I think uh, there is a limit of the unification of the West in the case of the uh, response to Russian invasion. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Pak Mohadi. Pak Pur, Pak Herman, do you wish to respond? No, uh, just a quick one. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the idea of will it get worse if NATO gets involved? Uh, the simple answer is yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think there's nothing beyond that in terms of, um, yes, it will get worse simply because it will put Russia in a worse defensive position it, where, um, where the use of nuclear weapons might become uh, something that it uh, might consider. Uh, and, and so, no, I, I don't think that it would be smart uh, if the other NATO countries actually come in, especially if uh, uh, there is no aggression 
uh, on the part of uh, direct aggression on the part of Russia against uh, uh, any of the NATO countries. Right. So right now we're 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 where the 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 conflict is actually rather limited in terms of mm -hmm. its scope. No, precisely because um, there has been some nuancing in terms of the involve, involvement no, of the uh, NATO countries in the uh, conflict. Thank you. Uh, Pak Por, you wish to also answer? Or? Well, actually, this, is, uh, this will be lesson learned number six. <laughs> number six. <laughs> which is neutrality worth more than ever. The principle of neutrality for some countries. Finland and Sweden has been you know, neutral, you know, claimed to be a neutral country for quite a while. But then suddenly, yeah, Germany, with the NATO, maybe not really big impact for Russia. Yeah, maybe, okay, maybe, yeah, it's depend. But if Georgia and then Moldova and Ukraine, Armenia, Azerbaijan, join NATO, that can be isolating Russia, mm -hmm. provoking Russia to behave irrationally, erratically. So the conflict will get worse and even worse, worse, as Japan's always say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, one thing, one aspect yeah, about, about mm -hmm. any war is that it never happens within a night, right? It tends mm -hmm. to, uh, the strategy tends to prolong um, the war so that the war of attrition will happen see who runs out of ammunition first right <laughs> so uh okay uh, ladies and gentlemen my uh, very reputable panelist it has been such a pleasure very, to me honestly it's very rewarding to have uh, discussed with you reflect my thoughts today it gained my uh, understanding new understanding surprisingly this despite us, each of us, uh, already reflecting on our own. I think that's the point of that's the point of doing this uh, kind of uh, meeting. Critical thinking uh, allow us to get uh, deep into the issue. Uh, you may notice that of all the things that we have raised, we uh, we have not talked about the UN, for instance, the United Nations, right? And I think I spare that uh, for the next. Uh, session. <laughs> if you wish for us to discuss about the UN, for instance, please send me message. I'm still open, you know, for opening further collaborations with other universities, with other scholars. Um, as the uh, coordinator for external relations in the uh, Association of International Relations, I'll be happy to receive your thoughts. Uh, you may reach me at the my email in, at binus, yeah? dina at binus.ac.id, very easy. Uh, so uh, yes, the relevance of the UN, where is it? We talked as if the world order happened without the UN uh, taking into, uh, into the, you know, into the, into the uh, situation. Uh, that's one. And then we also haven't talked about uh, proliferation of uh, weapons. Um, the acquisition of uh, technology, artificial uh, intelligence, the incorporation of uh, military industrial complex of some of these uh, uh, superpowers <laughs> or even emerging powers like India, they already have that in the back of their mind that if necessary, they would pull out uh, that um, that aspect into the uh, global uh, arena. Uh, we accelerate energy transition. We have to uh, acquire uh, knowledge to um, transform our energy needs very, very soon. It's like, I think, you know, to their, uh, to their mind, it's, it should happen within months instead of years. <laughs> uh, and nobody um, talked deeply yet about this, uh, but, I can uh, assure you, I, we can also talk about this. I can uh, pull out uh, some speakers who can discuss about this as well if, if needed, because these are important future for us, uh, for the new generations attending this uh, critical mind. These, you are witnessing a very important uh, part of the history of humankind and of the world. So. Once again, thank you very much, Professor Herman Kraft, for your sincere collaboration and support. 
Pak Julius uh, Purwadi Hernawan and also Pak Muhadi Sugiono and also to the uh, Chair of Association of International Relations Pak uh, Nas, uh, Pak Asep and also uh, Rangga Aditya my uh, colleague and boss in the International Relations Department at Binus University uh, Aditya, the chair of the committee who prepare all the things, you know, the e-certificates, uh, whatever, whatever you ask, it will be arranged by Aditya. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. And to my staff who helped me arrange, identify the issues and do some uh, literature review to prepare for this uh, meeting to be possible. So uh, nice work, everybody. I'm uh, grateful. Hopefully everybody feels uh, elated by this meeting today. I'm returning the uh, screen uh, back to the MC or directly to Ranga. Okay, uh, thank you, Prof. Okay. Dina. Okay, once again, I would like to thank uh, Professor Herman Joseph SK, Mr. Yuri Surwadi, Mr. Muhadi Sugiono, and of course, our moderator, Professor Dina herself. Now let's give a big round of applause to our speaker, discussion, and moderator of today's event. I hope all of the participants today have received a lot of new and in-depth knowledge and insight from the lively discussion. Sadly, our discussion must come to an end soon. But before that, a symbolic handover of e-certificates will be made by Mr. Rangga Aditya, PhD, to our speaker, Professor Herman Joseph Ashcraft, MA. Uh, to the operator, you may share the screen. Thank you very much, uh, MC. Uh, Professor Herman, thank you very much for your sincere collaboration today, also for your very thoughtful presentation. We learned a lot about what happened uh, there back in Ukraine. So please allow me to send this token as our uh, appreciation for today's webinar. Thank you very much, and I really hope we could extend this kind of collaboration in the future, like Madina already mentioned before. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rangga and Professor Herman. And next, uh, Mr. Rangga will also hand over the e certificate to Mr. Julius Purwadi Hermawan, PhD, as the first discussion. Masper, thank you very much, Masper. It's always a pleasure for us to uh, invite you in our webinar or other forum. I really hope this can strengthen our collaboration between the University of Parahyangan or UNPAR and Binus University, as well as with the Indonesian Association of International Relations. Thank you very much, Matpur, and see you again in another forum, okay? Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Papur. <laughs> thank you, Rana. Thank you, Papur. Uh, the next hand over of certificate uh, will be given to Mr. Mohadi Sugiano MA as the second discussion. Mas Muhadi, I really love to hear oh, about many things about Europe from you since you are the expert on this particular uh, discourse. Thank you very much, Pak Muhadi. Uh, I really hope we could invite you again on another forum, especially those who relate with the European uh, discourse. Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Muhadi. Thank you very much, Virina. Thank you, Pak Mwadi. And last but not least, a handover of this certificate from Mr. Rangga to our moderator, Professor Dina Pakto Raharja, PhD. Uh, I really love to this, this tokens to Madina because the idea itself for this webinar it came from Madina. We have like a long discussion about uh, who will be invited, what kind of uh, topics that we're going to discuss at the webinar. And uh, finally, after those many discussions then we can uh, hold this webinar thank you very much Martina. i really waiting for the critical mind <laughs> another, <laughs> another another issue another discussion uh, it would be really lovely to find this on our indonesian association of international relations thank you very much Martina. thank you ranga thank you very much everybody Thank you, uh, Thank you, Prof. Uh, now we are finally come to an end of today's event. I hope all uh, attendance. MC, MC, sorry. Maybe before we end, I also would like to thanks to all of the committee 
that prepare everything. I really know that's uh, a source of discussion for this event. Thank you to all your hard work. And we are going to do another international relation lecture series in the future. Thank you very much also all, to all of the participants for this webinar. Thank you, thank you. Tanga, one more. I think I would like to mention the presence of Ambassador Alan Razif. Oh, I see. I didn't <laughs> notice. <laughs> Ambassador, Ambassador, yeah, Ambassador Alan uh, was stationed in Laos, Cambod uh, oh, Laos uh, yeah, in Southeast Asia. So uh, he also teach now. So thank you very much, Pa Razif, for coming. Well, really, we are really honored to accept you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ambassador Rajiv. And I really hope that uh, in the future we can collaborate because there's a lot of things that happen in Laos also in Asia and that we really seek to uh, an excellent uh, uh, discussion, especially from those who station in the law itself. So it will be a very good insight for us in the international relations community. Thank you very much once again, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Madina, for noticing me. <laughs> Thank you. Back to the MC. Yeah, MC, please. Thank you, Saranda. Thank you, Pahdina. And also welcome to Mr. Rajiv. Thank you for coming to our webinar today. Uh, once again, I hope all attendants have gained a new fun knowledge and insight from today's webinar. But before you leave the Zoom meeting, I would like to remind all participants to fill out the extra ticket by scanning the QR code on the screen or by clicking the link that will be put on the chat box. Uh, you may scan the QR code or click the link. Therefore, today's webinar has come to an end. Thank you to the speakers and participants who have participated in the first episode of Critical Mind. As the MC representing today's webinar committee, we would like to apologize for any inconveniences or mistakes which took place during the webinar. Thank you for attending and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Please don't forget to fill out the exit ticket. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, Herman. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks a lot. Mas Pur. Thanks. Yes. Bye, Prof. Herman. Pak Muadi, terima kasih. Pak. Thank you, Prof. Pur, terima kasih. All of you. Kembali lagi ya. Thank you. Ketemu sama ketemu ya. Ketemunya perlu onset, Mas Pur, Mas Muadi. Kita atau. <laughs> Ayo dikonvin. Enggak. <laughs> <laughs> Jangan janji dong. <laughs> Harus kita cari waktunya nanti ya. Ya, ya, ya. Oke. Okay. Ya, Mbak.